Stars. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see so many people here to worship our Lord and Savior today. We're just blessed to have such a family of God together. For those of you who don't know, my name is Abigail Bolton, and I am the children's minister here at Whitefield. We have just a few announcements as we are getting started today. Coming up very soon on March 6th through 10th is our women's beach retreat. And we, the sign up for it, it the, and the balances are due by February 29th. So today is the 25th and the 29th is coming up really fast. So if you have any questions about that beach retreat for the women, please see um, Catherine Comfort. She would love to tell, have any, talk to y'all about any of that or Miss Mikey. They would love to answer any questions that you have about that beach retreat. Our marriage ministry, we are very excited that next week, March 3rd, is going to be our very first dinner with childcare provided for that marriage ministry. Um, please sign up in the Connect area if you haven't already. We are um, just ready to be able to spend time with married couples who are at very different stages in their marriages to learn from each other, encourage each other, just like the church is meant to do. If you are a guest, we are just so glad that you have taken time out of your week to spend time with us. If you'll look on the pew in front of you or inside your bulletin, inside the bulletin, you'll see a QR code. In the pew in front of you, you will see a guest card. We would love if you would take a moment to fill that out, to let us know a little bit of information about yourself and a little information about how we can serve you. And then we would love it if at the end of the service, you could take that to the front of the sanctuary there. You'll see a guest table, and we'd love to do an exchange with you for that card to give you a little gift. Um, and thank you for spending time with us today. You'll also see in our WBC News part of our bulletin, make sure you look in your bulletin because there is so much going on right now for our church. But you'll see the Journey to the Cross uh, announcement. And this is what we're going to be doing on March 30th for our children's Easter activity. Those of you who give so generously every year, it is time that we need some help with candy. We have so many different children come to our campus on March 30th that we need your help in having individually wrapped candy or small little treats. Um, they do not necessarily have to fit inside of an egg because this year we're going to be doing goodie bags rather than stuffing them in eggs. So if you wanted to do something a little bit bigger that you've thought of in the past, now is the time to do it. Um, let me double check everything because like I said, we got a lot going on, guys. Y'all better check behind me because I'm sure I'm forgetting something. 
Today, right after service, we are having our VBS sneak peek. If you are interested in serving with VBS in any way, shape, or form, please meet me and Kelly Young in the multi-purpose room right after the service. It will be less than a 20-minute meeting to go over some of the changes in the different areas that we have to serve in Vacation Bible School this year. And we are just really wanting to get y'all excited to see everything that we believe God is going to do this year for VBS. And speaking of VBS, we want to give y'all a little glance back at last year to remind you everything God does in Vacation Bible School. Well, good morning, church. Man, I can't say enough how exciting and how much fun VBS is. So if you've never participated or volunteered with us before, I'd just like to encourage you again, like, like Abigail did, like jump in, jump all the way in, because we have the opportunity to share the gospel with hundreds, I mean hundreds of kids for an entire four days. It, it, it's a really incredible time, and we need all the help that we can get. So... Come to that meeting this afternoon. You'll get to know everything that you need to know about what it looks like to volunteer for VBS. And so before we get started, we're going to read from the book of 1 John. We're going to read chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. John writes, for this is, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Would you stand with us and let's worship our Lord together. Let's go. 
Well, good morning, church. Aren't you glad that our God is for us today? Well, you wouldn't sound that little if you were at the football game on a Saturday. Aren't you glad today that God, our God, is for us? Amen. Amen. That's much, much better. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Before we go to our prayer time this morning, I want to just remind you of a passage that we find in Psalm chapter 62, where we're reminded that our God is for us, that he is our mighty fortress, that he is our strong tower, and he's faithful and true, and he's trustworthy. Listen to what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to to his work. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, there are many who are sick and of our fellowship. And if you picked up a prayer sheet this morning, you know the many names that are there. And I'm not going to list any this morning unless I miss some. But let me encourage you uh, day by day to lift each of those up in prayer that God might touch them and heal them uh, according to his will and his plan and his purpose for their lives. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, what a joy it is for us to be able to come together today in your house to worship our great God, a God who is for us, a God who loves us, a God who cares for us beyond our understanding and even our imagination. Father God, we give you praise today and we thank you for the songs that we've been able to sing to you this morning already. Lord, I pray that our worship today Lord, just our time of of meeting with you and singing your praise, Lord, that our praise and our worship to you today would always be as a sweet and holy aroma to our great and our mighty God. Father, we love you today and we praise you for all that you've done in our lives. Lord, for giving us the... uh, the health and the strength to be able to be here together today to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But Lord, we know that there are many in our midst who would love to be here today of our fellowship and our friends who would love to be able to worship with us today. But Lord, they're sick. And Lord, they need a touch from your mighty strong hand today, the hand of the healer today. And Lord, wherever they are today, we pray that you would visit them, whether they be at home or in a hospital room today or in a rehab unit somewhere, Father, that you would reach down and you would touch them and you would restore them if it could be your will in their lives. And Lord, we ask that you continue to be with our service this morning as we praise you. As Pastor Mike comes to bring your word in just a few moments, I pray, Father, that you'd use him in a very powerful way. Lord, speak into our lives today. Lord, we need a fresh word from you today. And we as your people stand in expectation of how you're going to speak into our lives today. And then, Lord, I pray that we, as we hear, would be obedient to all that you ask us to do. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Would you please stand as Brother Corey comes to continue leading us in worship this morning?
of the grace that you showed us through the cross that we can have life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Today we are in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nation, nations rage and the kingdoms totter. 
He utters his voice that the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for a chance to come to your house, Lord. Thank you for being our fortress, for being our refuge, somewhere that we can come to in times of trouble. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what Pastor Mike has to say, Lord. I pray that you use his words and let yourself be glorified through them. I thank you for this offering that we're about to have, Lord. I pray that you take it and multiply it and use it so that you are glorified. We love your name, I pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Uh, it's good to be back uh, with you this morning and uh, grateful for uh, the time of worship uh, that we had uh, this morning. A great uh, reminder and goes with our uh, text this morning from Psalm 46 and uh, grateful for uh, Pastor Corey and our praise team uh, this morning. We were short on a couple of uh, musicians, but still sounded uh, wonderful and we're grateful for um, uh, the talent that we that we have here grateful for those who serve uh, running our sound and our media as well uh, if you're brand new to Whitefield we're glad that you're here uh, my name is Mike McMahon I get uh, the unique privilege to serve as a senior pastor here and I'm grateful uh, that you chose to worship here at Whitefield today uh, if you're um, a, a regular, a member, uh, been here often. We're so glad that you are back. And uh, we have a lot of folks that are out sick um, and uh, hope that they uh, um, get well quickly. And I know I look out here and I've seen a lot of folks who have been out and are back and are well. So we praise the Lord uh, for that. And i um, grateful to be again back with you. If you will, as you grab a copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Psalms, we'll be in chapter 46 this morning. As we think about uh, this question, is there a, a place that we can go to when we are weak, and weary, and worried, and restless? Is there, a, is there a place that we can go to uh, when we are feeling that way and enduring those kind of things. That's the question uh, that I put before you this morning. That's the question we'll address in our passage this morning. If you found your place there in Psalm 46, I'd ask you to join me in, in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we um, were reminded this morning through the song uh, that, God, you are for us, that you will not let us down. You have never failed us. You won't fail us. We have victory in Jesus and in him alone. And Lord, because of that, uh, we have hope. Um, Lord, we have joy. We have mercy. We have grace. Uh, Lord, we, we have all we need, even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of Weakness, Lord, we know that you are our fortress. Uh, you're our refuge. You're our stronghold. You're our God. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you, you love us, Lord. That you're with us. That you're for us, Lord. That this is, this is not the end. There is a, there is a, the end. Uh, Lord, the end is you, and uh, eternal joy uh, it awaits those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, but in, until we enter into your eternal presence physically, Lord, I pray that um, as we know that you are with us here even now and in the midst of us, Lord, we, um, we pray that you'll You'll enable us to, uh, Lord, to point people to you, um, to glorify you, um, to show that you are worthy uh, of our praise and of our worship and, uh, and of our very lives. Uh, Lord, help me to, to preach your word today, Lord, and may you get all the glory and we get all the good. We pray these things and ask them in the name of Jesus. Amen. By a, a show of hands, how many of you, when you were kids, and I'm aware we have some kids in our sanctuary this morning as well, but how many of you ever built a fort when you were a kid? Raise your hand, fort of some kind, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's most of us, if not all of us. If we build a fort indoors, we grab some bed sheets and pillowcases and blankets and we did that in our living room or we did it in our bedroom or, you know, if we did it at the grandparents' house, we could do it in any room we wanted to because the grandparents would say, hey, have at it. And we'd do it in the kitchen where the food was close by. But if you didn't make one inside, you made one outside. 
You got branches and limbs and anything you could find in the, in the backyard or in the woods near your house, and you kind of built a fort. And when we built these forts, we wanted to make them strong, right? We wanted to make them uh, secure. We wanted to, the, our forts to, to be able to withstand anything that came uh, their way. And sometimes without even being aware of it, we would build, we would build these forts with, with an enemy in mind. Maybe it was a next door neighbor that you didn't very much care for. Maybe it was the, the neighborhood dog that was vicious. Maybe if it was, if, if you were like me, maybe it was just a sibling that you just didn't want to get anywhere near you. You're trying, you know, trying to try to hold up against uh, your, your sibling. And that's, that, that was my case. I had a, I, my, my sister's three years older than me, and from the ages of six to about 14, I thought she was the meanest person on the planet. I was terrified of her, and still am to some degree, uh, even, even now. But I would build my forts to withstand the storms of Stephanie, and my forts never held up. She was, she was too strong. Uh, and, uh, but maybe you, maybe you guys built forts similar to that, and you have similar stories as, as mine. My, my point is, at, at a very young age, we are trying to create a space of safety and refuge. We're building these forts because we, we want to create a, a space, a place where we can be safe and feel safe because we realize very early on that we live in a dangerous world. We live in a world where the strong abuse the weak. We live in a world where circumstances can change in a moment, in a phone call, a world changes. We live in a world that is seemingly spinning out of control. And we live in a world without any sense of peace. And living in a world like that, church, can leave you weak and weary and worried and restless. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're in one of those places or maybe you're in all four of those. You were, you were all four. You're like checking every single one of those boxes. Is there a place that we can run to, go to, when we are weak, when we are weary, when we are worried, when we are restless? Well, there's not necessarily a place to run to or go to in times of trouble like the forts that we built when we were kids, but there is someone that we can cling to when we're feeling all those things and more, someone we can cling to in our time of, of trouble. Our scripture tells us this morning that our God is our fort or fortress. He is our refuge. He is our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Now that Hebrew word fortress, it means a high place, a lofty place, an inaccessible place. Meaning that if God is our fortress, he's able to keep anything and everything from getting to us or getting the best of us. Isn't that why we built forts to begin with as kids? It wasn't to keep things in, it was to keep things out. Keep things out from harming us or getting to us. And our scripture today says God is our fortress. So that whatever may come, nothing is stronger or mightier than God. And there's four things I want us to see in our text this morning regarding God being our fortress. The notes will be up on the screen I encourage you to, to write them down if you're a note taker. First of all, God is our fortress of strength in our times of weakness. Look at verse 1. Psalm 46, 1 said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Now, most scholars believe that the backdrop of this particular psalm comes from 2 Kings 18 and 19, and we won't take the time to turn over there, but I would encourage you to read those chapters this afternoon, Psalm 18 and 19, but I'll give you a brief summary of of really what's taken place in those two chapters. The Assyrian army, which was, uh, Assyria was the uh, nation during that period of history, okay? So they have already defeated the northern kingdom of Israel and wiped them out and sent them to exile. And now they have moved from there and they've moved south and they've come to the doorstep of Jerusalem and they're surrounding the, the walls of Jerusalem. And the field commander of the Assyrian army comes and he's commanding that Jerusalem surrender. He's taunting them. He's saying that no no other gods of any other nations have been able to withstand this Assyrian army. And he's threatening them. Now imagine if you're inside the walls of Jerusalem and this massive army has come to surround you and their army is 10 times bigger and mightier than you, you have no shot to defeat this army. It's vast and you don't have the resources. It's only a matter of time before they invade and your city is destroyed and you are destroyed. Got the picture in mind? Well, word of this reaches the ears of King Hezekiah who was king of Judah at that time. So he hears the situation, and he goes, Scripture says, he goes and he spreads the matter out before God in prayer. You may say, well, wouldn't God already know what was, was he not already aware of what was going on? Absolutely, he was aware. Because like I said a couple of weeks ago, Hezekiah, he comes and he, he, he wants to be honest before God. He wants to be weak before God and say, listen, this is a situation, there is no hope. If if you do not intervene, God, we have no hope. And the Lord responded through the prophet Isaiah. He said this, I will defend the city and save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. And that night, the angel of the Lord came through and slayed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. And God spared and saved the city of Jerusalem. The nation of Judah was weak. The God they worshiped was not and is not. And that's the same God that we serve today. He was their refuge. He is our refuge. He was their strength. He is our strength. He is a very present or literally a very proven help in times of trouble. He's our fortress and our strength in our times of weakness. And church, when are we weak? We are weak, truthfully, all the time. All the time we are in need of God to be our strength. It only takes our brain to quit sending signals for our body to breathe and we're done. A cell, a blood clot, go rogue, we're done. A, a, a foreign nation to, to, to set off a nuclear weapon and we're, we're done. Truthfully, we are weak daily. Every moment we're weak. But when we acknowledge our weakness before God, then what? Then we're strong. A couple of weeks ago, we, we made reference to this passage, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. It's the apostle Paul. He's struggling with this thorn in the flesh. And we don't know exactly what he's, what ailment that he's struggling with, but he's struggling and God's not taking it away. He's having to suffer. He's having to endure that pain. And he says this, he's bringing this before the Lord over and over again. And this is, this is Jesus's response to him. My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. That was the message. That was the message Jesus gave to Paul. 
It's like, I'm not going to take this away. Uh, you got to endure this six more months or, or, or 10 more years. Nothing. He just says, my grace is sufficient for whatever it is you're going to face. And so Paul's like, therefore, okay, this is what, this is the truth he's laying on me. Therefore, for the sake, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that Follow me so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The only way we have the power of Christ to rest upon us is to acknowledge our weakness before the Lord. And then his power rests on us. Then he goes on verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses. I'm content with insults. I'm content with hardships. I'm content with persecutions I'm content with calamities. Now I'm adding those, I'm content for effect, but for when I am weak, then I am strong. That's when we're strong. You want to experience the power of Christ in your life? Acknowledge that you're weak. Trust in, and, we're, and I'm, I'm getting ahead because that, that's going to be part of our application points, but he's our refuge, he's our strength, he's our fortress. So when you're weak, and maybe you're weak this morning, Maybe you're weak. I would invite you to pray a, a prayer of, of transparency, a, a prayer of honesty. God, I'm weak, but I trust you're strong. For whatever reason, you may be weak this morning. You, you and I, we do not have a weak God. We have an almighty God to get us through. He is our fortress of strength in times of, of weakness. Secondly, God is our fortress of steadfastness. When our circumstances change. Look at verse two and three. Psalmist continues, therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Now the earth is giving away. That's what, that's the picture he's painting. The earth is giving away. The mountains are falling. The seas are raging. I can't imagine a more frightening thing for us to experience. It's like literally the world is falling apart. That's the, that's the picture that the psalmist wants us to kind of get in our minds that the world is, is falling apart and perhaps you feel like your world is falling apart. It's, it's, it's just crumbling. But the psalmist wants to bring to mind that even if the worst should happen, we don't have to fear. Why? Because God is our, is our fortress. He's our fortress of steadfastness. He doesn't waver when things go bad. God has never once and never will wring his hands in anxiety. He's never, God is never anxious, even though we are. He's never worried, even though we are. He never scratches his head. He's never perplexed by something that takes place in our lives. He's aware of it. He's already prepared for it. A couple of months ago, Pastor Joey and Pastor Corey had reached out to some pastors uh, that are nationally known uh, across our country and made them aware of our situation with uh, our son Alex's passing and and asked if they would uh, send us a Con, uh, video uh, of condolences uh, and give us uh, uh, an encouraging word. Uh, and it was, I mean, just, we were blown away by, by those pastors who took part in that. And, and uh, it's one of the best gifts that, that I've ever received. And Martha and I were so moved by um, all the pastors that took, took part in that. But there was one in particular, uh, Pastor Tommy Nelson. He pastors Denton Bible Church in Denton, Texas. And I've been listening to his sermons for years. Love him and, and just a, a great Bible teacher and preacher. And one of the things he said uh, in his uh, condolence video was that God is not always pleased, but he's never perplexed. He's not always pleased, but he's never perplexed. He's often not pleased by the things that we do, by the evil that's, that's done in the world, but he's never perplexed by it. He's never perplexed by what's gone on, and he's, he's not unaware of it. He's, 
He's never perplexed by, by our situation. He's not perplexed by, by yours. He is steadfast even when the world that we live in isn't. Even when we aren't. When things, when circumstances change, when our world feels like it's falling apart, God is steadfast. He's immovable. He's our fortress of steadfastness even when our circumstances change. Thirdly, God is our fortress of sovereignty who who rules and reigns over all of our enemies. Skip down to verse six for a moment. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Now, the psalmist makes us aware that the nations were raging in his day. We know the nations rage today. The nations have raged uh, since the fall of, of Adam. Leaders of nations, they want something that they don't have, so they'll do anything to get it. If that means murdering, they'll do it. That means bombing, they'll do it. That means whatever they need to do, they're going to they're gonna do it. That's, we have seen kingdoms rise. We've seen kingdoms fall. They did it in the, in, in the psalmist's day. They do it today. And they will until the Lord returns. Nations warring against other nations. Since 2002, the U.S. alone has spent $8 trillion in the post-9-11 wars. In the last 22 years, $8 trillion, that is a a number that's just even hard to fathom. That's one nation over the past two decades spent on war or defending freedom and justice. There's no telling what the dollar amount would be if we added up all the wars of all of human history. We don't even have a name for that much money and that many resources. Human beings go into great lengths to see that their kingdom rises and another kingdom falls. What I want you to see there in verse 6 is the contrast that the psalmist presents to us. Did you notice it? The nations rage, the kingdom, kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the, verse, the, the, the earth melts. Human beings are going to all this trouble, using all their resources, the very lives of the citizens of their countries to try to get their kingdom up to where they want it to be. And using all this effort and all the Lord has to do to have the earth melt before him is speak. That's all he has to do is speak in the earth would melt. That's the power that our God has. Look down in verse 8 and 9. He says, come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. God is able to make wars cease amongst nations and the wars that may be going on in your own home, he's able to make those wars come to an end. He is willing to do it. He is able to do it. And now here's why the why God being our, our fortress of sovereignty is so comforting because he is sovereign over all things, over, over everything. There is not an enemy that exists that he is not triumphing over now and will not ultimately triumph over. Not one enemy, not Satan, not not. The world, not hell, not death, not even your own wicked flesh. He is able to triumph over everything we face. Everything. He is a mighty God. He is our mighty fortress. Our fortress of sovereignty who rules and reigns over any and all of our enemies. And then lastly, God is our fortress of serenity when our lives are in turmoil. Look at verse 10. The psalmist says, be still 
and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And those are quotes. That's the Lord speaking. Telling us to be still and know that he, he is God. Now that is a very well-known verse. You probably know it by heart. You've, you've probably heard it read in maybe a hospital room or at a funeral service or a graveside or something. And why is it read? Well, because sickness and, and death can shake us to our very core and it can it can feel like we're robbed of peace and we have no peace and we're not sure if it's going to return and we long for it we want serenity and we're not sure that it's coming and sometimes things come along in life that rock you so hard you feel like you're living in an alternate reality some of you know exactly what i'm talking about you feel like this is not the world you once lived in like you're, on a, you're in an alternate timeline and you can't get back to the old one. And you long, you long to, but it's not coming back. But you want it to. So what do we do? What do we do when that's our new reality? What do we do when we've been, you know, shaken to the core of, of who we are? The psalmist says, Quoting the Lord, we need to be still and know that he is God, not not us. What does it mean to be still? Well, literally, it means to let go. To let go. The things that we want to hold on so tightly, they don't belong to us anyway. They belong to him. And we have to, we have to live life. And it. Because everything we have, it belongs to you. So we live life that way. And we let go and know that there is a God who is our fortress. And we allow him to be our peace when we can't count on anyone or anything else. And church, I, I want to be as, as transparent as I can with you during this season of, of my life and my family's life because I, wanna, I want God to be shown that he is worthy of our praise and of our worship and our obedience. He's good. He's a good God. We don't know. We don't have all our questions answered, but we know he's good. I know he's good. He's proven it over and over again. In church, there's been dark days. Personally, there's been dark days for, for me, dark days days when I have felt like I have been robbed that because my son did not get to live on and have years and I feel like Martha and I have lost something because we didn't get to see him become a husband and a father and you know what church if I allowed my mind to continue to focus on those things it would lead me to despair it would. But I'm so thankful that by the Spirit's urging and the Holy Spirit's presence, he has redirected me in those times and pointed me to the God of Psalm 46. That he is our refuge. He is our strength. He's our fortress of strength and steadfastness and sovereignty and serenity. And what I found is when I fixed my mind on him, there comes his peace. He will, it's true, he will 
keep those in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. So I have to discipline myself to stay focused on who God is and what he does. Do, 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 do I still hurt? Yes. Do you still hurt? Sure. We, we do. We, we, we just carry that hurt with us. But we cannot, I cannot, you cannot, we cannot forget that we have a God who is our fortress. We can fail, we can falter. He never will. He never has, he never will. He's our fortress of strength and steadfastness and sovereignty and serenity. So if you are weak, if you are weary, if you are worried, if you are restless, remember this truth, cling to this truth. And I want to give you four quick ways. And this is just not, that's not all there is, but I, I, want, I want to give you at least four ways that you can lay hold of this truth this morning. Number one, admit that you're weak. Admit that you are weak. You, you are weak. I am weak. That's the truth. You just got to admit it. You got to be honest with yourself and honest before God that you are weak. Because here's what we need, church. We cannot live life without this one thing, okay? We cannot live life without grace, the grace that comes from God. That's the only way we can manage to live this life on planet earth is the grace of God given to us by faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And it's that grace that we only receive. God says he gives grace to who? James says it, to the humble. And what do humble people have a habit of doing admitting that they are weak? You want to find a strong man, like, like biblically strong man, it'll be a humble man. It'll be a weak man. It'll be a, you want to find a godly woman, it'll be a weak woman. It'll be a humble woman. You want to lay hold to the truth that the psalmist presents here in Psalm 46, admit that you're weak and you'll get the grace that God promises and the strength to endure. Secondly, so you admit that you're weak. Secondly, you, re, you rely on God's faithfulness. Rely on God's faithfulness. Listen to the words uh, in Lamentations chapter three, verses 22 through 24. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, are, are, his mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. If you, if you are a child of God this morning, meaning, and, 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 and let me give a clarifier, you're only a child of God if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you've turned from yourself and turned from your sins and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, believing that he took your place. He died for your sins. And he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead three days later. He ascended to the right hand of of God the Father with all authority and all power. And if you, if that's you, if, if you're his child, you can rely on him to always come through. Always. His mercies are new every single morning. And he loves you no matter what may come. So rely on God's faithfulness. Thirdly, rest in God's sovereignty. Rest in God's sovereignty. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, God is able to work even the worst things we face in this life and ultimately work them for good. How does he go about doing that? I can't tell you definitively, but he's God. And because he's sovereign and rules over all things, he's able to do that and willing to do that for those who love him. Paul would say in the next two verses that if you trusted in Jesus Christ and that you are saved, he's going to make sure that you make it all the way to glory. So if you're a Christian here this morning, let me remind you, you are going to make it. You're going to make it all the way, not based on what Pastor Mike is saying, based on what God has declared, you and I will make it all the way to glory. All the way. Because of who God is, 
we can rest in his sovereignty. And if you think, if you're, if you're there and you're like, man, what is, what is sovereignty? What does that mean that God rules over all things? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take an illustration from A.W. Tozer because I like it and, and it kind of makes sense for my simple mind and maybe it will be helpful to, to you as well. When A.W. Tozer was trying to explain what sovereignty looks like or trying to define it, he said, picture a, an enormous ship that has left its port. And this ship houses all of humanity. Every human being that has ever been born is on this particular ship. And there's a lot of things that happen on this ship. There's a lot of people that use their free will to do evil, rebel against God, do evil to others, wicked, evil things, mean things happening on this ship. There's good things that are happening on this ship too that's housing all of humanity. People are are recognizing who God is and they're responding to him, they're following him, they're worshiping him, they're serving him, they're loving him, they're loving others, all on this ship. And the captain of the ship is God. And he's fully aware of everything that has taken place on this ship. And he's gonna see to it that that ship reaches its intended port and there's nothing that can happen on that ship that can take it off course. God is gonna make sure that it arrives at the time it's supposed to and at the place it's supposed to. And when that ship reaches its port, everyone who has done evil and who has rejected God will be separated him forever. And everyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone will enter into eternal joy with God forever and ever. And every wrong that has ever been done in this, on this ship will be made right. And God will wipe away every tear that we have ever shed. As a matter of fact, he's keeping track of it. He keeps it in a bottle. He knows every tear we've ever shed. And he's gonna wipe it away. And we can trust in his sovereignty that even though we don't understand sometimes, even though we don't know, we're headed to a fixed port. And there's no one that could move the captain from the helm. He's gonna take it to its intended place. That's, we can rest in God's sovereignty and lastly, enjoy the presence of God. Notice verse four and five, we, we skipped over them just, just a moment ago. Psalmist directs the reader's attention. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Now, there's a, a near and far fulfillment there in verses four and five. The, the writer of the psalm wants to bring to mind of the, for the people of, of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, that there is a place in, within the city where there's a temple and where, where the spirit of God is chosen to, to dwell in the, in the holy of holies. That there is, a, there is a place that they can go and enjoy the, the presence of God. And they would go and, and, and they would bring their sacrifices to the, to the temple. And once a year, called the Day of Atonement, uh, the, the high priest would go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt. But he could only go once a year. And he had to bring sacrifices for his own, for his own sin, right? And so it, it reminded the Old Testament believer of two things. One, that their sin leads to death, that their sin was serious. They had to, 
they had to place their hands on, on these animals and then those animals had to die. It was a way for God to remind them that their sin is serious and it brings death. But it also reminded the Old Testament believer that God was a forgiving God, that he was willing to punish. He had to punish sin, but he was willing to punish someone else on their behalf. There was a place they could go and enjoy the presence of of God. Well, things have changed since the psalm was penned, right? The Son of God has come from heaven to earth born of a virgin, so he doesn't inherit the sin of Adam. Adam, He lived perfectly, willingly went to the cross, died for your sin and my sin, rose from the dead, ascended to, to, to heaven. One day he's coming back for those who put their faith and trust in him. And what else has changed is that, that when, when Jesus died on the cross, the temple was tore from top to bottom, signifying that from now on, we have access to the Spirit of God At all times, in fact, Scripture tells us that the same spirit that used to indwell the temple now indwells every believer. So we can enjoy the presence of God whenever and wherever we are if we are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So... This river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High, it is just a shadow of the heavenly substance. There is, and we're told in the book of Revelation, there is a city, a holy city, where there is a river of life and God is there. That's in our future, church. That's, that's in our future. That's, that's coming for us. God is in the midst of of every believer. And notice there, verse five, God will help her when morning dawns every day. Every day we can enjoy the presence of God. We just have to be reminded of the truth that, that we have here. In Psalm 46, church, God is our fortress, our fortress of strength, our fortress of steadfastness, our fortress of sovereignty and our fortress of serenity. So if you're weak, if you're weary, if you're worried, if you're restless, remember he's our fortress. Put those things into practice. Believe that this is true. And whatever it is you need to lay before him today, maybe it's in the pew, maybe it's down here at the altar, maybe it's the person you need to go to, maybe there's some action that you need to take today. Maybe... It's to simply turn from your sins, turn from yourself, and turn to Jesus Christ and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. The pastors will be down front. We'll be available even after the service is over. If you need to talk with someone, if you need to just do business with God, you do it today as we stand and as the musicians come. Father, we thank you this morning that you are our fortress. You're our refuge, and and Lord, you know we need it. This world is, oh, Lord, it's, it's, it's so difficult, so difficult, Lord. Help us to continue to lay hold of you and the truth of who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're ultimately going to do. Lord, lift us up today. Lord, help us enjoy your presence Lord, in this time of response, I pray that you will will hold sway over every heart, every soul, every mind here in this place. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Church, as always, it is a blessing um, to gather with all of you, uh, to worship, to fellowship, to give, um, to hear the word of God proclaimed, and to see God work in our lives and in the lives of our church. I would encourage you all to, to be back tonight at 615 as we uh, continue. Uh, Dr. Luke Stamps uh, continues to uh, kind of take us through uh, what we believe as, as a church, as as Baptists, uh, and uh, so I hope that uh, you will uh, be here tonight for that. I want to leave you with these words from Romans chapter 15, uh, verses 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul writes, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, church. Love you. Have a wonderful afternoon.